There are two possibilities when foraging for survival. Person A is completely dependent on whatever they find as their main source of calories and carbohydrates or proteins and fats. They haven't found anything else to eat yet. Person B has managed to hunt or to forage or to trap some of the other animal or they found a high calorie food like honey for example and whatever else they forage is going to supplement that diet. Now depending on the situation you find yourself in, you're going to fall into either one of those two categories. And it's going to mean that you have to prioritize certain foods over others while you forage. Here are some considerations around foraging for survival. I'm Clarice, welcome to the Live Ready channel. So in this video I'm going to touch on a couple of edible plants in the area but I'm going to try to stick to the ones that occur internationally so that those of you watching from abroad will also benefit from some of the information. And um, anybody who's ever tried to diet before, especially someone who's tried to count kilojoules or calories um, in order to lose some weight will have gained some really valuable knowledge from that experience. The reason why I'm bringing that up is because once you understand that certain foods don't have a really high kilojoule count or a really high calorie count, you start to realize that not all of them are actually worth foraging in a survival situation. To give an example, foods that are really low in calories are things like mushrooms or lettuce um, or even tomatoes. So you can eat those foods, but they're not going to provide you with a whole lot of calories um, and you're not going to be able to sustain or maintain your metabolism on those foods. What's more is that you actually spend quite a bit of energy foraging, finding, preparing those foods and then also metabolizing and digesting those foods. So you expend calories trying to find the food and if you pick foods that are really low in calories you might find that you're running at an energy deficit for all of the energy output and what you get back from the food. So to give you an example, what's next to me here is called dune spinach. Um, Tetragonia decumbens and I believe this occurs or a similar plant is found in New Zealand as well and it's found in the coastal regions it grows on the dunes it's actually a wonderful plant because it holds all of the seeds and things together on the dunes and promotes growth of other plants on the dunes um, it also provides nutrients to the soil because it does drop some leaves every now and then so this is perfectly edible um, it's a spinach basically you can cook it up with a bit of butter or a bit of animal fat if you have some available or you can eat it raw. It's really high in sodium and potassium. It's a great food, it's actually quite tasty and it's got these tiny little hairs on it and that's how it's easy to identify. The reason why it's called Tetragonia decumbens is because it has a four-sided fruit in its flowering season which around here is I think August to November. And it has these tiny little yellow flowers that you find in groups of three to five at the end of the stalk. So that's how you can identify it. Um, and there are similar plants to it, so keep an eye out for it the next time you're on the beach. Now for a person who's foraging for survival, any sort of calorie source is going to be valuable to them, especially if there's nothing else. So if you find um, only dune spinach and you've got nothing else in the area that you've been able to hunt, forage or fish or trap, um, then this is still going to be valuable. Um, but to give an idea, in a cup of this dune spinach, you're only going to get about 16 calories. It's not a lot. It's pretty much similar to lettuce. And there's only about one or two grams of proteins in that cup. And there's only about six grams of carbohydrates. So not a really energy dense food. Still tasty though. It has a nice salty taste. And if you... Um, if you're craving salts because you're needing electrolytes, because you've been dehydrated, you found some water but you haven't managed to eat anything yet, the sodium and potassium in here are going to be really valuable to you. But as an energy source, not much from there. It should also be noted that our bodies can't actually break down all of the plant materials that we digest. So for example, um, household spinach is really high in iron. But our bodies can't actually break down those plant cells to get to all of that iron. 
it doesn't mean you won't absorb any iron from it it just means that the amount of iron that there is and the amount of iron that you actually absorb from the spinach is vastly different so you don't actually get a lot of iron from that plant you're almost better off going for things like raisins to try and get iron from that so a very valuable resource but not the highest priority in a foraging for survival kind of situation So this over here is ulva lactica, it is sea lettuce and it looks a bit like a piece of lettuce, it's actually an algae and this is found worldwide in the ocean so it's actually quite easy to come by and it has sort of a, a salty sea like taste, completely edible and um, you can cook it up in a stew or in a soup, you can eat it raw like I've just done, even Indy likes to eat sea lettuce um, or you can even dry it out and eat it as a snack. In comparison to dune spinach, sea lettuce actually has quite a lot of carbohydrates and proteins in it. In 100 grams of dry sea lettuce, you'll find about 60 grams of carbohydrates. It's a lot of kilojoules and calories that you're going to get from that product. And about 13 grams of protein, which is really high for a plant. I believe it's even higher than peas. And any person who's a vegan or a vegetarian will tell you that you can't just remove one food group from your diet. You have to supplement it with something else. So if you by choice are not eating meat, um, something like this is a great way to supplement your diet and to substitute protein um, from animals for protein from plants. Now sea lettuce also happens to be really high in iodine, which is good for thyroid function and vitamin B12, which is good for nervous system function. Um, so really, really healthy plant material to be eating. And if you do find yourself foraging somewhere near the coast, do try it. Um, it has really nice salty taste. Once again, high in sodium, once again, high in potassium. It's even high in calcium. So it's almost like a superfood for foraging. Now it should be noted that any person's diet should be made up of proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, minerals, and water. So in a survival situation where you're foraging for survival, first focus on the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the fats that you need in order to keep going, and of course water. And then once you've managed to keep your metabolism going, then you can worry about a healthy metabolism that includes vitamins and minerals. The only mineral that I would really say is going to be essential for survival right from the start is salt. Sodium is going to help you to absorb water and to keep you from dehydrating. So those electrolytes are quite important. But you'll probably gain a lot of them from the plant materials or the animal foods or products that you manage to eat from the beginning. There are other sources of proteins from plant materials as well. We're thinking about nuts here, we're thinking about legumes, we're thinking about all kinds of plants that are just higher in proteins like peas for example. And if you haven't managed to hunt or trap an animal to get some fats into your diet, remember that pine nuts are really high in fats and you can find those from pine trees all around. So I made a video about using pine as a survival food. It is a wonderful survival food. It literally has so many uses in terms of um, edibility and in terms of fire and shelter building. So go check that out. I'll link that video over here. So in my former example of person A who's foraging for survival and the very first thing they find is going to be the very first food source that they have and person B who's foraging to supplement a diet of animal foods or a higher calorie food such as honey um, person A should rather focus on trying to find something like sea lettuce before they go foraging for dune spinach because it's going to benefit their metabolism more. That's why I say we prioritize different foods or finding or foraging different foods um, depending on what else we've managed to find and forage. So what I've got here now is a Num Num or a Natal Plum, Carissa Macrocarpa. And these are also found in coastal regions, but they're found all over the world these days, even though they are indigenous to Natal in South Africa. And they're quite a tart tasting little fruit, similar to like a berry, maybe like a cranberry. Um, and they've got this edible latex on the inside. So once you cut them open, you start to see um, this latexy juice that runs out and that is actually a natural latex. Don't cook them in aluminium because the latex sticks to the aluminium and remember that these are really poisonous for dogs. So keep your dog away from the bush and from the fruits at all costs. Um, that's why I harvest these and I move away because Indy is with me today so we're not going to stick around the bush just now. She tries to 
um, eat some of the berries or some of the leaves because she'll just eat absolutely anything she finds. So that's why Indy has now got a biltong wheel instead. So now the advantage of something like this is that it is high in vitamin C, it's high in vitamin A and it's high in vitamin B1. So you get some vitamins from it, but it also has about 260 kilojoules in 100 grams of these berries. So the berries are the edible part. You can identify them by the little white flowers that grow on the bush and they've got these little round leaves and um, sort of like a pointy small red fruit. And as soon as it goes really bright red, the fruit are ready for eating. So this is going to benefit person A and person B purely for the amount of calories that you find inside one of these fruits. Um, because it has so much energy, even though there's not a lot of proteins, there's almost no protein in this, um, and there's quite a bit of carbohydrates, you'll get about 13 grams of carbohydrates from these little fruits and 100 grams of them. Um, the fact that they are so high in sugars is going to supplement the energy um, and the diets of both person A and person B. So really a worthwhile thing to forage if you can find it. Nothing for you, doggy. Mm. Quite tart. Sweet-ish tasting, but tart. And actually a real treat too. And once you get used to foraging these plants and the plants that are in your environment, the things that are edible in your environment, and you get used to them, then you start to actually naturally supplement your diet with those things. And whenever you find them, you go, oh, I can add some of these into a salad, or oh, I can add that into a dessert. These are really great to make jams and preserves with. Mm. <laughs> so let me just say this to clarify. Don't discard any edible food as a source of potential calories or carbohydrates or proteins when you are foraging for survival. The fact is that any calories or carbohydrates is better than none. It's just that if you have the option or the knowledge to choose between different plants when you are trying to survive in the wilderness, then some of them are going to benefit you more than others. If you are unsure whether a plant is edible or not, you can do a little toxicity test. Um, so what I like to do if I want to find out if something is poisonous or not, is first of all hold it in my hand for a few minutes. Then I discard it. If I have zero reaction to it within an hour or so, then I can move on to the next step of that test. Then I'll take one of the little leaves or the fruit or whatever I'm curious about. I'll break it open and put a little bit on the inside of my elbow, which is quite a sensitive piece of skin. If I have no reaction to that within an hour or so, then I can move on to the next test. Then I can take a small piece of it and put it around my mouth, which is also a very sensitive sort of area. If I once again have no reaction to it within an hour or so, I can take a small piece, put it on my tongue and hold it there for a few minutes and take it out. Don't chew or swallow it at all. Take it out again, wait another hour. If no response, then I can chew it. When I chew it, I then once again spit it out after an hour or so, no response, then I can chew it, swallow it, just a small piece, and then I'll wait eight hours. If I have no reaction to it within those eight hours, then I will say that it is safe for me to proceed to try and, and eat a little bit more of it. Um, that's not going to tell me whether it's worthwhile eating though. Like I said, some plants don't have a whole lot of calories in them. In those eight hours, I won't eat anything else that I'm uncertain about because it may give me mixed test results then. So I would rather then not eat anything that I'm not familiar with in those eight hours and drink a lot of water. I've only briefly touched on some of the foods that are available in the wilderness or in this environment today. And um, there are so many facts about them that I haven't even managed to mention in this video. If you do have some comments or you have some suggestions for foods to forage, do go and post it in the comments below. It may well save someone's life at some point. Until the next time, live ready. Come in, Nikki.